Born in Kentucky, made in America, and inspired by the world. That's Wild Turkey. And as creative director of Wild Turkey and co-creator of Long Branch, I am here to tell their story. And it's led me on a search for other folks who don't mind taking the hard road in order to do something great. I am here to shine a light on some trailblazers, innovators, groundbreakers, people that make stuff happen for good. I want to know where they're from, where they're going, what they do, how they do it, but most importantly, I want to know why. They have an unwavering conviction to do what they do. So maybe I can get inspired, and maybe you can too. The way forward for humanity is to build better people. So let's take a seat, take a sip, let's talk turkey. What if the world was engineered to invisibly make you happier? Stan Buettner. Explorer, <laughs> adventurer, world record holder, New York Times bestseller, founder of Blue Zones, and generally heroic man <laughs> from whatever angle you witness him, Dan Buettner. Good to see you, my How brother. You doing, All right. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Listo. Listo. I mean, the first thing, when I heard you talk about what you do, I was like, this guy has the greatest job in the world. <laughs> he goes around the world finding people that are happiest, live the longest, the most self-satisfied, studies those people, and is now sharing those consistencies with the rest of the world. What a job. So I have spent 20 years now identifying these places where people live the longest. And, you know, they eat plant-based, they tend to have a strong sense of purpose, they um, tend to live in places where they're nudged into movement. But the, the, the big insight here is that when you try to pursue health or happiness or longevity, it almost never works. Uh, the secret is that longevity successfully ensues from the right environment. In other words, uh, you don't necessarily want to try to change individual behavior. We're delusional if we think we're going to get 330 million Americans to buck up and eat a healthy diet and get their exercise every day and social. It's never going to happen. It's never happened in human history. But what you can do is you can shape people's environments to set them up for success. You can engineer their surroundings so they're nudged into slightly healthier behaviors. <laughs> that also means intelligent, by the way. Does it? Yeah. As well as ready? Yeah, estoy listo, I'm ready. Soy listo, I'm intelligent. <laughs> Let's talk about this word happiness. Funny word. Yes. Funny word. Everyone's looking for the right definition. Most people don't have it right. I mean, most people think of happiness as a place, a result, an, an attainment. Oh, if I get there, I can then be happy. Never works. It's, it's more than fickle. Why does it not work? So you really have to start by understanding that um, we don't exactly know what happiness is, but we know the componentry of happiness. We know that part of being happy is enjoying your day-to-day -day experience, moment to moment. Uh, a second ingredient is um, being satisfied with our lives, having a sense of pride, of being able to look in the rear view mirror and say, I like what I see. Behind and, me, what I've done, my yes, lineage. Yes, my, my, my legacy, my, my values, uh, the people around me, I've treated them well. Um, things that, that make you feel good about your life. And then that third ingredient, that thir third strand is purpose. According to Gallup, two million surveys, only about 30% of Americans actually like their job. 70% are doing it because they have this illusion that uh, if they work hard today at this job, I don't really like, in some imagined future, you're gonna be happier. And research shows that you're wrong over half the time, so. And really? Yes. So the happiest place in the world is a place we found in Northern Denmark called Ohus. On average, they're working 70, 37 hours a week. They're taking six weeks of, of vacation. But we in America, on average, we only take 11 days of vacation a year. Uh, we work about 45 to 47 hours a week. So we are spent, we're burning too much of our day-to-day, our -day, in-the-moment joy for 
uh, uh, delayed gratification right. down the road. Racing to the red light. Die with the most toys. Have, uh, yeah. have a whole bunch of money and for what? That would yes. be an argument. Would be, you would argue that? Like, what, 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 what do we say? What are we making strategy. more of it for? Yeah, it's the wrong strategy. At the end of the day, following passion is usually a short term and a long term long term strategy that pays off. You're a pretty happy person. Been around you, known you well. What, what do you do when you've run into your hurdles, when you've run into resistance? So right out of college, when most people are doing useful and productive things with their lives, I decide to bike from the top of North America to the bottom of South America. I want to set a Guinness World Record. Um, I want to start by putting my rear wheels in the Arctic Ocean and end with my front wheels in the Antarctic Ocean. So the first guy I go see is my Spanish chief, and most is Latin America. And he was a mentor of mine, and I lay out this plan in my great detail, how I'm going to do it, what I'm going to pack. And he listens to me very quietly, nods his head, and he looks at me and he says, you are going to need a golden horseshoe up your ass to survive. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it was like, you know, here it was. I was so excited. I expected yeah. to be. But, you know, I'm blessed with this, this, this um, hungry curiosity. That's, that's like an engine that keeps me going. But also... Uh, Irrational optimism. Uh, I'm not very good at hearing I that. I call it delusionally optimistic. Yeah, <laughs> delusionally optimistic. Yes, I have that delusion. I don't hear the word no very well. Yeah. You know, your dad said something to you. It resonated. We were late up in Santa Barbara talking late one night, and um, you were you were talking about acting and making that decision. You called your father. Do you remember what he said? Oh yeah, I remember that call very well. I was sweating that call. It was when I was going to leave law school and go to film school. And they were helping pay me my way through school. And I decided I want to go to film school. And I'm like, oh, geez, I got to make that call <laughs> to mom and dad. And uh, I called and I said, dad, I, I, I want to go to film school. <laughs> On the other end of the phone, I hear, is that what you want to do, son? I said, yes, sir. Well, don't half-ass it. And I, I remember tears welled up in my eyes. Ah, oh, ah, oh. he's not as he only okay with it. He's sending me out with fire on my ass. Go, well then don't half-ass it, go do it. And it was, it really gave me the incentive and support from the person who I thought was gonna go, you wanna do what? You know, but instead he completely surprised me and told me don't half-ass it. I found that don't half-ass it to be incredible. I've thought of it ever since you brought it up. I think so much of what we do, we half-ass it. We sort of give up when it, with the first no or with the first hurdle, and then you really never get anywhere. Yeah. But it, I think that don't half-ass it wisdom is far more powerful than, than, uh, than the words themselves might convey. So you brought up your friend George Plimpton, and, and, and you said, uh, I read this quote that he told you one time, he said, you can do what you love and make a living with it if you can universalize your experiences and be artful with them. He was a huge um, inspiration for me when I was this kid from Minnesota. I blundered into meeting him at the right time in my life, who just sort of took the blinders off of uh, what is possible. And it's that line that gave you the tools to pursue your dream. Because at the end of the day, if you want to be an explorer, you have to think of a way to give back. The explorers that we've always admired the most through history, Magellan, Columbus, they've always gone to faraway places and brought something back. There are no more meaningful geographical expeditions. We've been to the top of Everest 5,000 times. We've been to the bottom of the sea. The new chapter in exploration has to bring back something that I, I believe is going to enlighten the human condition but it has to be delivered artfully. People mm -hmm. like a good story. Something that makes a mouth tingle a little bit. Yes. Tastes good, I wanna hear that. I wanna be there. I could tell you all day long that what you're supposed to eat, 
how much physical activity you're supposed to have, the, the, the ingredients of the food that are most likely to make you live longest. But after a while, your eyes are gonna glaze over. If I tell you the story of an old lady who's eaten these foods and lived this type of life, you're gonna remember that old lady. You're gonna remember uh, the emotional bond you have of a story well told um, way longer than you're gonna remember the facts. And when that food tastes good, we eat more of it. That's right. <laughs>